Welcome to the Cup for Time podcast here at the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay. I'm joined by Eric Stearns, and today we're talking about my sermon from Sunday, which was the start of our Advent series called The Inn, and Sunday was all about how we make room in our lives for the gospel to become the defining narrative of who we are. So we're talking about grace, and we're talking about grace being real in our lives and how we accept that grace and make sure that we know that Jesus still loves us, that we are worthy of his love. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, There was a couple of things I I, I cut. Um, I wanted to talk. There's a Brene Brown quote. Um, I may have said it on the podcast before. But anyway, the quote is, the people don't suck on purpose um, in order to piss us off. Um, You've never said that before. Okay. So... That's the, that's the one thing that I cut because, you know, this whole idea about making room in ourselves, you know, is, is that work of saying, you know, especially with the innkeeper, he does not suck on purpose in order to piss the Holy Family off. Like, he did the best that he could with what he had been given mm-hmm. and made it work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the same is true for us. Like, we don't suck on purpose. Like, we, I mean... We fall short, we fall flat, we mess up, we screw up, whatever, however you want to say it. More often than not, it's not on purpose. It's just a mistake. Mm -hmm. And rather than defining ourselves by that one mistake, we define ourselves in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came for you to die for your sin on the cross so that you could have life and life abundant. There are certain stories that threaten to define us that we just need to lay aside uh, to to take more of a role. Like if we're going to have a different view of ourselves, something has to give. Mm. There are stories and things about us that we think are so crucial and so mm-hmm. critical that, that just aren't, that just aren't the reality, that aren't true. That's, that's the only part that I didn't dig into that I wanted to dig into. So how did you come up with this series? This series actually comes from an organization called Worship Design Studio okay. um, from Marsha McPhee um, in specific. Um, she's the, the, the kind of the the mastermind behind Worship Design Studio. I had the opportunity uh, through the nonprofit church leadership certificate program through Dakota Wesleyan to actually have a class with Marsha McPhee, like mm-hmm. a whole, like one of our sessions, Marsha McPhee came as our guest professor one day. And just nice. really, I was very impressed with her um, and just the way that she puts things together and, the, and, and her heart and passion for worship. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's like this, I mean, if I wanted to, which I don't, cause I'm, you know, I still want to be respectful of my context. Like, there's an entire, like, order of service that we could be using for this series. Like, she puts out these turnkey worship series and then also opens up, like, forum posts and, like, blogs and other things where you can interact with other people that are doing the series and saying, hey, what's working for you? Oh, I could take that and do this. Um, You know, and so this this whole community exists out there on Worship Design Studio. Hmm. Um, And so she kind of gives you the general idea and the general theme and then she gives you the resources to truly make the series your own and truly, you know, come up with, with what's going to be happening in the course of, this, of the series. Interesting. Yeah. How often do you do that? Um, um, I did uh, the Broken Vessels at Lent um, was, was Worship Design Studio. Mm-hmm. And because that was so well received, I wanted to do, try it for Advent too. Nice. She's a really down to earth and just kind of a, just a cool person. And then she just has such a creative brain that... You know, I just, I just am in awe of the work that she does and what she puts out for pastors. Like she gives you the general theme of the, ser- of, the, of the series and, like, the ideas, but then, like, the sermon was completely mine. Like, that's not, that's not something okay. that, I, that, that I got that was truly, that is truly my work and my preaching. Okay. So. That was actually going to be my next question. Yeah. Like. So. I took the idea of there being no room at the inn and our desire, or our need during this Advent season to make room in our own lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then it just went from there. Like mm-hmm. those two thoughts together, that was my sermon. You were right on this sermon that we've spent our whole lives like hating the innkeeper. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Like yeah. how you had that song of... Not once, but twice. What was the line? Um, ungenerous soul of savage mold and destitute of grace. Yeah, that'd destitute be... Destitute of grace. I wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah, no. As, as a, no. So... Nope. I don't know. I just... that. It's a complete paradigm shift of just the innkeeper, but really that's just the... the window dressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... 
Yeah, because the, the, the real nugget that I hope we take from it is that we can have a different perspective of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like we can have a different, different perspective of the defining narrative of our lives. Like the defining narrative of the innkeeper's life is that there was no room at the inn, he told the holy family, and then stuck him in a stable. Mm-hmm. That's all we know of him, and that's all we care about. Right? That's how we see it. Mm-hmm. How often do we do that in our own lives? Right. How often do we take our mistakes and magnify them to the point of, you know, I'm unworthy of God's love. How could God possibly love me? I am so frail. I am so fractured. I am so broken. I am so damaged. I am so unworthy. You know, that's not our whole story. Our mistakes are not our whole story. Grace mm-hmm. is bigger than that. God's grace is bigger than that. You know, the gospel is bigger than that. That's right. not our whole story. Are they part of us? Yes, they are. And have we, you know, hopefully we learn to do better as a result of the mistakes that we make. But to just beat ourselves up is just not what we need to do. Or to hold ourselves back is just not what we need to do. Right. Because Jesus has a, you know, especially on this first Sunday of Advent, Jesus has a hope that is so much bigger. Mm-hmm. And we are worthy of that. Regardless of who we have been, we're worthy of that because of who Jesus is turning us into. Yeah. And it, as you were saying that, I was just thinking about, you know, like our kids will beat themselves up, you know, verbally. Like they'll say, oh, I'm not good at this or, oh, mm-hmm. I'm not good at this. Well, if, yeah. if we're not there to tell them that, no, you're, you know, you're good or whatever, yeah. you know, encourage them, build them uh-huh. up, they'll continue to believe that. Yes. We don't have anyone to, Verbal, you know, because we always beat ourselves up on the inside. We're not yes. telling everyone that we're bad at this or whatever. Right. We don't have anyone there to pick us up. Mm-hmm. And so we have to do that ourselves mm-hmm. or through God's grace, we're able to do that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So if we encourage our kids to not beat themselves up, mm-hmm. we have to do the same thing for ourselves because yes. otherwise, if our kids see us down, they're going to be down too. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. Not only does our mood, our well, however we're carrying ourselves, mm-hmm. projects on everyone else around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, if we don't feel like we're worthy of God's grace, the people we interact with, right, are going to start to feel the same way. Mm-hmm. It's not just about our kids because we can be that voice for other people as well. Absolutely. Like we can, you know, our sphere of influence needs like those are the people that we can influence Mm -hmm. and say, you know, you may have some some growing edges in this Mm -hmm. area, but you're not terrible. You're trying. And that's, and that's half the battle some of the time, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I just think that there, that that we have the opportunity to be that voice for people that don't have that for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to get caught up in that negative talk. Oh yeah. And think, but, but you have to, if you get stuck in that negative talk, you're going to continue to go down in a spiral. Correct. But if you can pick yourself up and realize that, yep, I screwed up, that was bad, let's not do that again and move on, mm-hmm. it makes a world of difference. And I think that that's what grace is. You know, mm-hmm. There's a story that I'll probably use this in the sermon sometime, but I'll give it to you on the podcast for free. Oh, um, man. Uh, when I was in college at USF, um, I took a literature class because Edward Clinton had to take this class, and um, Dr. Bengson was the professor of that class. I love her dearly but she assigned a paper that I just completely spaced off doing. 100% did not do, did not even, she said, it's time to turn in your paper. And I said, oh my God, what paper? And she said, you're going to talk to me after class. And I said, oh no, oh no, this is so bad. And she said, I'll give you two days. As long as you realize that this is what grace is. Mm Mm-hmm. And that has so stuck with me through the years of like, this is what grace looks like. She had absolutely no reason to do that. Her late work policy was clearly specified in her syllabus at the start of the semester that she didn't take late work. Mm -hmm. But yet she had grace for me. And so how much more does God have grace for us? Like God doesn't just say you have the next two days to fix this. God says... We're going to do this together, and I'm with you every step of the way. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus came, and that's why Jesus did the things that Jesus did, and that's why the Holy Spirit dwells in our lives, is because Mm -hmm. becoming more Christ-like 
is a gradual, lifelong process that we're not alone in, in in any stretch of the definition. And, you know, sometimes the, you know, we can talk to our sphere of influence, but we really need to talk to ourselves and say, you know, what defines me? Mm -hmm. And it's the gospel. It has to be the gospel. You want to talk about the prophecy of Jeremiah some more? Sure. Maybe expand on that? Yeah, totally can. I find that really interesting. Because you said there was kind of two, not schools of thought, but... Not, I mean, no, it, not schools of thought. Movements, really. Yeah. Talk about those. Like, mm -hmm. the first half and the second half. Yeah. Um, so, with a lot of the Old Testament prophets, they have this ministry of pre and post. Mm -hmm. um, they have this prophetic word that is coming from God to the people of God saying, Hey, follow my ways. <laughs> follow the law or be a good, you know, Hebrew believer. Um, and if you don't, then there will be consequences. The exile is coming if you do not turn away from, you know, mm -hmm. turn, turn back from your ways. And like I said on Sunday, the people of God either did not care or wanted to kill Jeremiah. That's why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Um, that's why he has an entirely second book in the Bible called Lamentations. The book of Lamentations are the Lamentations of Jeremiah hmm. because the people of God treated him so badly that he lamented to God because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and he recorded them down in poetry um, as a way of expressing himself and expressing you know, just how unfair his plight was, and rightfully so. Um, and then, as we know from history of the Bible, uh, the exile does come. The Babylonians, the Assyrians go into the north, the Babylonians come into the south, and they are wiped off the face of the map. They're just wiped away. Hmm. They are taken to Assyria, they are taken to Babylon. The Assyrians, we don't really hear anything more about them, but we hear about the Babylonian captivity, and we hear about the return to Jerusalem. And like, even as the exile is happening, as, you know, as Israel is falling, the word of God is with the people through the prophets. And the prophets are saying to them, yep, this is bad. This stinks. It's not forever. There is a bigger hope. The stump that we have become is not the final story. And that's into where we get into Jeremiah 33. So this is deep into the book of Jeremiah. Um, this, you know, and like the famous verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, where he says that I have a, a plan for you and a, and a plan to prosper you and not harm you. And that comes at this, in, in this shift, mm -hmm. um, in, in, this, in this second movement of, the, of Jeremiah. Uh, it's the same thing with Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah has, uh, up until chapter 40 of Isaiah, it's all about, you know, the first couple of chapters are Isaiah is called to, to prophet, to, Isaiah is called a prophetic ministry. And then there's this middle section where it is warning the people of God about what's to happen. And then there's a major tonal shift at Isaiah chapter 40, where it says, comfort my people. Comfort, says God. You will serve your term. You will, you know, there will be comfort for you. It's the same thing in Jeremiah's message, where there is this tonal shift and total shift um, to these words of encouragement in the midst of exile, that even there they are not alone because God is with them. Even after everything, God is with them. The stump that they have become is not the end of who they are. There will come a righteous branch, a righteous branch from David. That's the important part of it, because that's the, the, that's the Davidic covenant, is that the Messiah will come from the house mm -hmm. of David to reestablish things, to reestablish justice, to reestablish righteousness itself. That branch, that righteous branch, is Jesus. Like, that's the only, you know, sometimes in Old Testament prophecy, there are other things that things can be. There's no denying that this is Jesus. The righteous mm -hmm. branch is Jesus. You know, being sprung from Joseph, being, being sprung from the Davidic line. Um, and so this is a message of hope the people that Jeremiah are talking to are not going to see this because they're all, they all super dead by the time that this all takes place. Mm -hmm. But yet the promise of God is true. And there is hope in the midst of all of that because the promise of God is true. Yeah. And the promises of God remain to be true for you and for me today in the same way that they were true for the Israelites. The people that Jeremiah was speaking to were long dead. Mm -hmm. But God still fulfilled that promise. Like I think we, we get so caught up in... Um, Quick results. Yes. We have no patience. Mm-hmm. 
But yeah, like Isaiah was, what, 700 years Mm -hmm. before Jesus came? Yeah. You want to talk about not having patience. Yeah, exactly. generation after generation that didn't get... Exactly. ...was hearing all this stuff and then didn't get to witness it. Mm -hmm. We can have the patience, you know, to... Right. God is going to help us work through our stuff faster than that. (laughs) You know? Yes, definitely. Yeah, and like, you know, people like to talk about how, you know, our more modern generations have... You know, this need for instant gratification, but yet we can buy it honestly because that's that's just human history. Mm-hmm. You know, like we talked about before a couple a while back. You know, Paul wrote like he like Jesus was coming back tomorrow, mm-hmm. and expected that to happen. He expected Jesus to come back in his lifetime. That's why he said in First Corinthians to, that slaves should remain slaves and single people should remain single and, and and married people should remain married because Jesus was coming back like that. Mm-hmm. And we're still waiting. Right. Yeah, still believe it, believe it to be true. That's the core of the fiber of who I am. But yet we're still waiting. And so, you know, this, it, this instant gratification thing has nothing to do with cell phones and microwaves. It's, you know, our human condition. Right. And what's next week? So next week is a continuation from last week. Uh, we talked mm-hmm. last, last week about how we make, do we do the inner work of making room and laying aside narratives about ourselves that are not true or helpful um, in order to make room for the gospel to be de- the defining narrative of our lives. And so the obvious continuation of that is into the idea of welcoming other people, of there always being room at the table. And that's especially apt because it is Communion Sunday, and in the United Methodist Church, we serve an open communion that anyone that wants to receive can receive a mm-hmm. communion. There is always space at the table for more people. There is always room for more grace to be extended um, beyond ourselves. And so the idea is, how do we make our space ready for people that don't necessarily believe as strongly as we do or that haven't had that mature growth in faith? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we make room for people that are going to be brand new? Because this Christmas time is this time where everyone is curious about Jesus. So there, there are people that kind of denigrate CEOs, or Christmas Easter onlys, or Christers, or however you want to say that. But I want us to have a different view and a different take to make room for a different narrative. That there was a quote, I can't remember who it's by, but there's a quote out there that says that what people are telling you when they show up to your church on Christmas and, Christmas and Easter is that when it matters, you're their church. Mm-hmm. And that has to be a part of who we are, that we are welcoming. And like, I will say that I serve a very welcoming church, and I love the way that we do already do this, but there's always room to make room, make more room in our lives for Jesus and accept different narratives about ourselves. There's always room to grow in hospitality. Mm-hmm. There's always room to grow in welcoming strangers and making people feel like they're truly a part of this place. Mm-hmm. And that the, the, the gospel can truly be a part of their lives because of who we are. We're very good at that. I don't. I don't want that. To, don't want that to be understated. Um, but there's just always room to grow. There's always another person to invite. There's always. It's, just, it's the idea of reaching the next person for Jesus, of never being content, and just you know always looking for opportunities to be willing to share our faith and to to welcome and accept those that you know maybe are not exactly who we are, and you know welcome them in mm-hmm. um, to the family of God. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm looking I really, forward to it. I really enjoyed this series so far. Good. Looking forward to the next few weeks. So join us again here on Sunday uh, for the second week of Advent, and then back here again next week for the podcast. Thanks for listening to our Cut for Time conversation. Join us for worship in person or on Facebook Live Sundays at 10 o'clock Central Time. And now go in peace and serve the Lord.